And I know that we've got quite a variety of different people here this morning. Uh, other people will come and join us as we carry on. And I hope that you will be blessed as we're gathered here today to worship and uplift the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As you can see on our screen, uh, it would be really helpful if you put your phone on silent or switched it off so as not to disturb others during the worship service. And I'm sure if there's something important for you, you'll get that a little bit later on in the service. So you're, you're so welcome. I just want to up front tell you that our church here is an evangelical church. We teach from the Bible. We teach the need for salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. It is an international church and it's a non-denominational church. Uh, and we want to encourage you to be part of our family this morning. Uh, and so therefore, I'm going, to, I'm going to do a quick roll call of the nations to see where you're from. Uh, we normally have quite a few nationalities in our service. And so it's really good that you kind of know who you're sitting beside, right? So that when you find out what country they're from, if you want the mood seat, you can do that. No, I'm only kidding. But it's good that you should know who you're sitting beside. Um, so first of all, just turn around and say good morning and welcome to the person beside you or in front of you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Now, I, 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 I'll do a little... Um, we will do a little roll call here just to see where you're from and see uh, something to keep a little count of the nations this morning. I think I'll start with the quietest group of people. That's the English. Anyone here from England? Okay. What about Scotland? Yeah. Yeah. What about Wales? Yes. Okay. What about Northern Ireland? Yes. Very good. Welcome to you folks. Uh, what about... Um, what about Norway? Yeah. Yes. Okay, what about the Philippines? Yeah. What about Belgium? Yes. Okay. Uh, what about Poland? Yeah. Yes. yes. What about Spain? Yeah. Okay. Um, who have I left out? I've left somebody out, I'm sure. Yeah, India, Africa, I don't know where. Zambia. Zambia, okay, that's another one. Very good. United States of America? Yeah! Welcome, welcome, welcome. Okay. How many was that? Anyone count? Eleven. Eleven. Okay. Anyone else I haven't mentioned so far? Any, anyone else? We want you to feel at home today. We want you to feel comfortable today. Okay. All right. Well done. Well, congratulations on being where you're from. Thank you for being part of our church fellowship this morning. God bless you. We've come to worship and uplift and honor the name of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. And if you've never been to our church here in Benidorm before, you are especially welcome. I want to tell you that in this service today, you will get an opportunity to give a gift uh, during our time of offering. And we believe it's an important part of our worship experience. For those of you who want to continue to support the work of the church, you can do that online at EnglishChurchBenidorm.com. It's really, really simple. After the service this morning, uh, an important part of our service and gathering is our tea and coffee time over here in our community area. So please feel free to join us for that if you can. And this week we meet twice this week on Wednesday and again on Friday. On Wednesday we'll have our Bible study and our prayer time. We've been looking recently at God's top ten. We've been looking at what the ten commandments are all about and how or if they apply to us today. We're on number five this week, which is really appropriate for the week that's in it. And I hope that you can come and join us on Wednesday and then we have our prayer time. And then Friday we have our communion service where we break the bread and remember our Savior together on Friday at 11. Do come and join us for those services. They're, they're good times. The Lord is here and we have some good community uh, together. Also this week, our ladies group, which is called Connect, has a special day on Thursday. They're going to go to, guess where they're going to go to? The Chocolate Factory in Villa Hayosa. How do you believe that? That's amazing. And they're going to be gathering there uh, for a tour at the Chocolate Factory at 4 o'clock. Then they're going to go for a walk and a meal. If you wish to travel by tram, as many of the ladies will, gather at the tram station at 2.50 
ready to get the tram together to the Villa Hoyosa. And Maggie will keep you right in all of that if you need any more information about what's happening here. Week after next is a special week in our church. We call it Grow and Go. We're going to meet every morning at 10.30 for some Bible time and praise and worship and testimonies and little practical seminars. Please do join us for that if you can. We'll gather and start about 10.30 in the morning um, and then later on in the evening we're going to go out onto the streets uh, in the mornings with some Bible teaching and some practical how-to sessions and then in the evenings we're going to go onto the streets and we're going to share the Lord Jesus in some uh, personal evangelism. So that's what we're going to do uh, on this uh, week after next. And we've got some friends of ours coming from Newton Breda Baptist Church in Belfast who are going to help us with that. My former church, they're going to help us with it. And they're here to really uh, excited, get excited about sharing the Lord Jesus with us and with other people. This morning we're carrying on our series. Uh, in fact, today is our last part of our series on the life of Joseph, journey with Joseph, uh, in those last chapters of Genesis, chapters 37 to 50. And then uh, we will listen to that, and we'll listen to God's word a little bit later on. So we're ready to sing, but before we do that, we're going to read the scriptures together from Psalm 146. And remember that this is the word of God. Let's read it together. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. His spirit departs, he returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Happy is he who has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps truth forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. And the Lord gives freedom to the prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises those who are bound by The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He relieves the fatherless and widows. But the way of the wicked he turns upside down. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. Amen. Uh, so read the word of God. I'm going to pray for us and then we're going to sing some songs of worship and praise uh, with all of our hearts to our great God. Let's pray together. And so Father God, we come to you today in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we thank you that we've got access into your presence today through him who loved us and gave himself for us. We thank you that Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And thank you, Lord, that we are completely and totally forgiven whenever we come and we bow in repentance and faith and we take him to be our Savior and our Lord. We thank you that death was not the end for him. We thank you that he rose again from the dead. This is a fact of history as well as a fact of scripture. And we thank you that Jesus lives today. And know we know, Lord, that one day Jesus Christ is coming back again to receive his people to be with himself. Lord, thank you for this little church here in Benidorm. Thank you, Lord, that we can open the doors and we can uh, sing these songs of praise out over this terrace on this lovely Benidorm day. And thank you, Lord, that we can look up onto the hills and realize that you're the God who made the hills. That we're the, you are the God who made the sea. You're the God who made the land and the animals and the plants and the flowers and the trees and the fish that swim and the birds that fly. You are the creator God. And in six days, you made them, and we rejoice in that. We thank you that you're also the God of redemption, that you so loved the world that you gave your only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you, Lord, for the death of Christ upon the cross and that amazing salvation work. So, Father God, as we come today, we pray that you minister to each person here. Lord, you know our needs, you know our burdens, you know, Lord, those of us who are used to being in church, and you also know those who are not used to being in church, and for whom this is a bit of a different Sunday. But thank you, Lord, that you make no mistakes. 
And you've brought us together into this place at this time for this moment. I want to pray for our friends who are visiting here today. Thank you, Lord, that they've come to our church this morning. And may your Holy Spirit engage with them as with all of us. Lord, we bless your name. We say with the psalmist, praise the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are a good God. And we lift up your voice. And we lift up our voices to you in praise and worship and adoration. We come to you, Lord, also to confess our sins to you. For our sins, they are many. Lord, we are so easily overcome by our own selfishness and by our own sinful desires. Forgive us, Lord. Have mercy upon us. For those things that are not pleasing to you, have mercy upon us, we pray. Thank you for the blood of Jesus, which goes on cleansing us from all sins. God, meet with us now. Hear our prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's a bit of a cloudy day today. Uh, but the sun is still shining, isn't it? The only thing is, you just can't see it right now. And I know this is really corny, but God is good all the time. And all the time, even when you don't feel it, even when the clouds and stuff sometimes obscure that, his goodness is still obvious to all of us. We're going to sing a song, a really good song of praise and worship. Let's stand together and sing it uh, together. I stand
the power that he has to set us free and to release us. Setting me free, this Holy Ghost power, setting me free this very hour. Because today could be a day of change for you with the help of God's Holy Spirit. Pray that you will teach us from it 
Open our hearts and minds to receive what you have to say. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as you take your seats, we are going to continue. In fact, today, we are going to conclude our Sunday morning series that we've been going through for quite a number of weeks now on the life of this man in the Old Testament who's called Joseph. And Joseph is one of the favorite characters in the Bible. And you can read his story in these chapters, 37 to 50, of the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. Now, I've got a challenge this morning, and that is, for some of you here who have only been here today for the first time, you may not know much about the story of Joseph. So really what I have to do is kind of bring you up to date with where we are, because there's more of the story behind us than in front of us, because today we're going to learn some of the lessons of Joseph's life as we learn about some of Joseph's secrets. And we're going to read in a moment from Genesis chapter 49, verses 22 to 26. You can follow it in the Bible on the seat in front of here beside you, or you can also follow it on the screen when we come to do the reading. But most of you will know, if not least from the amazing, Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, something of the story of Joseph. He was the favorite son of his father Jacob. His granddad was Isaac. His great-grandfather was Abraham. And Jacob was the son of Rachel. Uh, for that reason, uh, he was the favorite son of his father Jacob. There were 12 boys. There was one girl. And uh, Jacob had four wives. In fact, Young Joseph grew up in a very, very dysfunctional family. And Jacob's favorite wife, of course, according to the Bible, was Rachel. And it looked like Rachel would never have a child until she gave birth to Joseph. And then later on, she gave birth to Benjamin and tragically died in childbirth as she gave birth to Benjamin. So we saw that Joseph actually had experienced quite a lot of death growing up. The death of his grandfather, the death of his, his mother's nurse, but also the death of his own mom. And that's a tragedy and a difficult situation for him to grow up in. That was compounded by the fact that his brothers hated Joseph. Why? Because his father had shown Joseph so much favor. His father had shown favoritism to Joseph, giving him the coat of many colors. And as a result, his brothers cast him in a pit, cast him aside, and sold him off to Egypt. Now, many, many years later, through many ups and downs and trials that we've looked at already on these Sunday mornings, Joseph finds himself second in command in Egypt. It's a remarkable rags to riches story from the prison to the palace. He's now second in command. He's been in the prison. He's now in the palace. He's been in the pit. He's now in the palace. He's now prospering. Things are good. He's got a wife. He's got two children. He has all the riches at his disposal in Egypt. And there is a famine in the land. In the world, actually. Joseph knew the famine was coming because God had given his, his boss, Pharaoh, uh, a dream. And the dream told Joseph that there was going to be seven years of famine, uh, seven years of prosperity, followed by seven years of famine. So Joseph said, well, during the prosperous years, let's store up all the grain. Then when the famine came, people had to come to Egypt to buy the grain from them. And Joseph's brothers traveled down to Egypt to buy the grain. And this mighty, powerful, distinguished official, standing in front of them, who looked every inch like an Egyptian, Dressed in Egyptian clothes, steeped in Egyptian culture, speaking the Egyptian language with that little Egyptian hat thing on that the Egyptians tended to wear. And little did they know that this was their very brother, Joseph, that they cast into a pit and rejected 22 years before. How could they possibly have imagined that their brother, who was taken away as a slave in the Egypt, could possibly be this majestic, mighty, second in command in Egypt, standing right in front of them, handing out the grain. Now where we left the story was eventually, uh, through lots of twists and turns, Joseph reveals himself to his brothers. They're stunned. They cannot believe it, that this is their brother. And then they have to return to get their old father, Jacob. Can you be sitting, could you sit in Jacob's seat? And imagine what it was like when their brothers returned from Egypt 
and said, Dad, we've got news for you. Really? Joseph is alive. That's enough to shock any man. For 22 years. Jacob believed his son was dead. No, not only is he alive, he's second in command in Egypt. He's the one who's handing out the grain. He's the one who we have to depend on to be fed. And Jacob and his sons and their families now make their way back to Egypt. <coughs> and God is working out his purposes. For this old man Jacob, this was a life-changing experience. He's got to pack up everything he knows. He's got to make that journey all the way to Egypt. <coughs> to be with Joseph, his son. And to be with his other sons. And to be able to eat the grain and to be able to be fed and to be able to survive. And his whole life has been turned upside down. Like for some of you who left Britain to come and live in Spain. You have a little bit of an understanding of the complexities of that. But this was far, far more complex for old Jacob. But now Jacob and his sons and their families are living in the land of Egypt. And this is part of God's redemptive history. Now here's what Joseph said to his brothers. This is truly remarkable. Let's read it together. Wait, if you can see it on the screen. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. Joseph says, God sent me here. Now how on earth did Joseph see the hand of God in such a terrible situation? It was God who sent me here. God sent me here to preserve a remnant. God sent me here to serve his people. Joseph sees things far bigger than his own story. God sent me here to save your lives by a great deliverance. You rejected me, he said to his brothers. But I'm here to save you, save your life. Does that remind you of anybody? Does that remind you of the Lord Jesus? Because he came onto his own and his own received him not. He was rejected by his brothers. But Jesus came to say it. Hold that thought. We'll come back to it a little bit later on. But Joseph sees that his story is part of his story. Joseph sees that his story, his own individual personal story, is part of a much bigger story. The story of what God is doing in the world. And I hope that you understand that you are not just a little island unto yourself. Your life is not about you. Your life is not about your happiness or your satisfaction or your comfort or your ease. Your life is part of a bigger story of what God is doing in the world because he is a sovereign God. And when you connect your story to his story, life begins to make sense. Not only does life begin to make sense, life has purpose and meaning and it becomes worthwhile getting out of bed in the morning knowing that you're part of God's story in the world. Now what happens is this, as we move towards the end of the book, old Jacob is soon going to die. And so he gathers his sons around him and he, and he and wants to pass on to each of his sons the blessing. And when you go into chapter 49, you will see Jacob's prayer for each of his sons. Jacob's wish for each of his sons. Now that is something that's a little foreign to us in our culture. We might leave behind us money or property to our children or to our grandchildren. But to these ancient Hebrews, what was important was the blessing. Yeah, the blessing of God upon their lives. And so the old man Jacob gathers his sons and he starts to uh, pass on the blessing to each of them. And when it comes to Joseph, chapter 49, verses 22 to 26, this is what he says. Let's read it together, will we? Joseph is a fruitful boy. A fruitful boy by a whale. His branches run over. The archers have bitterly grieved. Just pause there for a second. Jacob says that Joseph has been bitterly grieved by the archers. They shot at him and they hated him. Who's he talking about? He's already talking about his own family, isn't he? 
Joseph's been so damaged by his own family. Let's read verse 24. But his bow remained in strength, and the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. And then this is how he continues to pray for Joseph. Let's read it together. Because of the God of your father, who will help you, and by the Almighty who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breasts and of the womb, the blessings of your father who excelled the blessings of my ancestors, up to the utmost bound of the everlasting hills, they shall be on the head of Joseph, and on the crown of the head of him who was separate from his brothers. In other words, Jacob recognizes that though Joseph has walked through very difficult circumstances and through a very difficult life up to now, Joseph is a fruitful boy. He's bearing fruit. Joseph has got strong bow. His, his, his targets, if you like, his purposes, his aims in life have not wavered. He's kept consistent. Joseph has had strong hands. Joseph has, been, uh, has had an outstanding testimony. And he's been entirely consistent and known the blessing of God. Wouldn't it be good if all of us lived like that? Wouldn't it be good if all of us experienced that? If every one of us here could have that said about us? The way Joseph lived his life. Now as we finish this series, I want to ask you the question, what are Joseph's secrets? Because in Exodus chapter 13 and verse 19 it says this, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him. Because Joseph had made the sons of Israel swear a solemn oath when he said, God will surely attend you. Then you must carry my bones with you from this place. So Joseph says, I'm going to die soon. And I'm, going to, I'm going to die and, and you'll bury my bones. But I want you guys to know that one day God's going to come and God's going to take us up from this place. God's going to bring us out of Egypt. We're not going to be here forever. And when you move up from Egypt, Bring my bones with you, okay? And that's a, a Joseph experiencing blessing, looking into the future, saying, this is going to happen. I promise you, this is going to happen. It hadn't happened yet, but Joseph said it will happen. He says, when it happens, I want you to swear to me now that when it happens, you will make sure that my bones are carried up. And so when we go all the way in the Exodus, we find that Moses is now the main man. And Moses knew of that. And so when Moses led the people back from Egypt, uh, back into the promised land, guess what he did? He brought the bones, the body, the decaying body of Joseph with him. But what were Joseph's secrets? How can you and I be like this man? Well, there are three things I notice about Joseph was kind of important for us as we land this series. The first thing is the way in which Joseph extended forgiveness to his brothers. Isn't it remarkable that despite what he had suffered at the hands of his brothers, he was able to forgive them. This, listen to uh, chapter 50 and verse 19 and 20. Let's read it together. Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see, when Jacob the father died, the brothers were still afraid that Joseph would turn on them. You know, they said, Oh, maybe, maybe they're only being nice because Dad's still alive. Maybe he's only being kind to us because dad's still alive. But when old Jacob died, the Bible says the brothers were afraid that Joseph would turn against them. And Joseph says, I don't want you to be afraid. Am I in the place of God? This is a remarkable thing. Where Joseph is prepared to place all of justice and all of vengeance in the hands of his God. Joseph was able to practice and exercise forgiveness right to the very end of his life. Well, could it be easier for him to punish the brothers? 
to take retribution on the brothers, to exact revenge on the brothers, Joseph's heart would not allow him to do that. He simply said, am I in the place of God? Of course I'm not. I'm going to leave this for God. But even more, he said, look, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Right? Your purposes and motivations were entirely wrong. But out of that, God has accomplished and made something great. Because he is God and we're not. Now, will you, if you're here today, leave the consequences of stuff in life with God. The Bible says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord Jesus taught us to pray in the Sermon on the Mount. Forgive us our trespasses as we what? Forgive those who trespass against us. How hard is that? How difficult is that? Our hearts scream for revenge and for, uh, for uh, to justify our actions. But no, we are challenged by the life of Joseph to exercise forgiveness right to the very end. Here's the second thing about Joseph. It's his just his incredible faith. Joseph lived by faith. From that first moment when he was cast into the pit and taken away to Egypt, we just see a man who is constantly at peace with his God. Who is constantly leaving the consequences of everything with God. Do you remember that incident in the, in the prison where he interpreted the dreams for the butler and the baker? And uh, one of them escaped, escaped with his life and the other one paid with his life? Just as Joseph had said. And he said to the baker, whenever you get back out, and whenever you're restored to your position, remember me, I'm still in this horrible prison. I'm still right down here. But the baker promptly forgot. And Joseph remained in prison. But we don't see anything in the Bible of him complaining or moaning or groaning about that. He just quietly, simply, puts his confidence and trust and faith in his God. I wonder what the quality of your faith is like. Joseph lived by it. We're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 7 that we walk by what? By faith and not by sight. In other words, the things that are important for us are things that we don't see. But we walk by faith and not by sight. And whether in the prison or the palace, Joseph's life was consistent and he had integrity. And that's an example for us to try to follow. In Matthew's Gospel, 28 chapters in Matthew's Gospel, we see four times Jesus rebukes his disciples with these words. You've heard them. O ye of little what? Faith. He said your faith is too little. The first place is in chapter 6 and verse 30. And right there in the Sermon on the Mount, he says to them, Why do you worry so much about everything? Why, why is worry just consuming you? Why is worry driving you, eating away at you? And Jesus points to the flowers of the field and says, Look at the flowers of the field, they don't worry. But God clothes them. And even Solomon in all his glory was not dressed like one of these. And then he says to them, So ye of little faith. In Matthew chapter 6, we see that the Lord knows our needs. The second place you'll find it is in Matthew chapter 8. And they're in a boat. There's a storm comes up. Jesus is sleeping in the boat. And they cry out, Lord, save us. Because they were terrified they were in the storm. And Jesus rebukes the wind and the waves. And the storm dies down. And he says, oh, ye of little faith. Do you trust me to get you through the storm? And in Matthew chapter 8, we learn that the Lord stills our souls. You identify with them in Matthew chapter 6? Worry, 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 worry. You identify with Matthew chapter 8 going through the storm? In Matthew chapter 14, you find Jesus walking on the water to them. Peter gets out of the boat. Do you remember that story? Peter tries to walk on the water. and he, When he looks at the waves, he starts to sink. He starts to drown. And the Lord rescues Peter from that. And individually, he says to them, Peter, ye all little faith because the Lord dispels our doubts he is the king of kings the Lord of lords who walks in water and can help us in every situation and then finally in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 8 you'll see 
them arguing about between themselves and discussing between themselves something that's physical when it should have been spiritual. They completely lost the picture of what they should be talking about. They were talking about bread and Jesus was really talking about spiritual bread and he rebukes them and says, oh ye of little faith. This has got nothing to do with bread. This has got something to do with a bigger picture. And in chapter 16 and verse 8, the Lord challenges our convictions. Four times, Jesus says, ye of little faith. And I don't know about you, but I would put myself in there. My faith is weak at times. <clears throat> My faith is poor at times. The Lord must be grieved many times with me. After all he has done for me, all my life, you have been faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. And yet, when I walk into a storm, or when I'm tempted to worry, my faith is so weak. And the Lord rebukes me and says, O ye of little faith. I don't think he could have said, O ye of little faith. To, uh, to Joseph because Joseph certainly lived it right to the very end and pursued it right to the end. But not only did Joseph live by faith, Joseph died with faith. His faith didn't abandon him as he got older. His faith didn't fall away as he got older. He died with it. This is what it says. Remember this verse? Joseph bade the sons of Israel take an oath and said, God will surely attend you. Then you must carry my bones up from this place. As Joseph is about to die, he's still looking forward. He's saying, God is going to do something for us as a people. You may not believe it yet. You may go through hard times yet, and they do. But God is going to come and rescue us. And even to the very end, Joseph died looking forward. And that's what I want to challenge us today. Let's look forward. Let's keep going in faith. Despite the struggles and the stuff we face in life, let us keep going with faith. Because that brings us to this last point. Not only Joseph's forgiveness and Joseph's faith, but Joseph's finish. What's more important in life? That you start well or that you finish well? What do you think? More important that you finish well, then start well. When I was in school, for school sports day, one year, I decided to run the 1500 meters. I'd never run the 1500 meters before. I had no idea how to run the 1500 meters. I had no idea the technical, or the breathing, or the pacing of the 1500 meters. All I knew was, at 15 or 16 years of age, it can't be that difficult to run a 1500 meters, can it? So I signed up for the 1500 meters, along with about nine or 10 of my contemporaries, and we lined up on the start line, and the gun went off, and we started off. And I ran, and I thought, I'll just run it as fast as I can. And so after about um, 300 meters, I looked around, and I was 30 meters in front of everybody else. I thought, this is easy, this thing. Anybody can do this. I can't understand why they're so slow. Well, I think you're ahead of me in the story, aren't you? You know what happens. You can't keep that up for 1,500 meters. You've got to pace it. You've got to breathe it right. You've got to, there's a technical aspect of running the race. And I was so, like, I was up, up front there running. I was enjoying the adulation of the crowd. You know, all the girls were waving. This. this is easy. But we had another 1,200 meters to go. And in the second lap, I suddenly realized that they weren't as far behind me. And I thought, they're, they're running faster. But they weren't running faster. I was running slower. And when we got to the third and fourth laps, I was so out of oxygen. I had started off too fast. I had gone, all guns blazing in the first lap. I, uh, as they call it, oxygen deficit. I was panting and puffing like I was an old person. And they ran past me with about a lap to go. And suddenly all my arrogance, all my confidence disappeared. As the winner took the acclaim of the crowd. And poor little Trevor. 
Chip still will. Hey, very, very last. Would it have been better starting well or finishing well? I've been better finishing well. And I want you to finish well in your Christian life. I want you to be like this man, Joseph, who didn't just limp across the line in last place. Joseph finished strongly. Joseph ran the race well. The Apostle Paul, when he got to the end of his life, said this, I have fought a good fight. Do you remember this? One of the last things the Apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And Joseph finished well. Do you remember when you were a child going to a fireworks display, maybe your parents did a fireworks display in the garden, and uh, the highlight of the fireworks would always be the rockets. And uh, I don't know what it was like in your house or family, but in our family we always used a little milk bottle. We'd put the rocket in the milk bottle, we'd light the fuse, and shoo, up would go the rocket. And it would shoo, up into the sky. And then it would just peter out. I, I still remember, have this memory as a child of the next day after Halloween or whatever it was, and, and going around the streets, and you'd see all these sticks lying on the streets because all the rockets had just petered out and just fallen into the streets. That which started off well just fell to the ground and collapsed. Oswald Chambers says this, some people have ascended like rockets in their youth, and have descended like sticks before old age. Is that you? Did you start off well in the Christian life? You had a love for Jesus, you had a love for the Bible, you had a love to pray, you wanted to tell other people. But stuff comes in. Life stuff. Difficult stuff. Relationship stuff. Financial stuff. Worries and problems and difficulties and families. And so have it going like a rocket. The same, like a stick before Middle East. Joseph was looking forward. Do you look forward? You may have heard of Joni Erickson Tata. I think Joni has to be one of my heroes, I think, in the Christian life, because Joni, as a young girl, you may know, died. Uh, at 17 years of age, she, she died off some rocks, and she broke her, her back, and she's been in a wheelchair ever since, Joni Erickson. And, she has lived a life, I think, of faithfulness and consistency. Uh, in her wheelchair, she's been a blessing to so, so many other people. Years ago, I read her book uh, about suffering. And I thought, well, she's, she's just a, you know, she, I think she's quite a young girl when she wrote the book, maybe in her 30s, a young lady, but I thought it, it won't be that profound, really. It will be quite anecdotal, but actually it was a wonderful testimony and a wonderful treatment of the subject of suffering from someone who's lived it every day. And Joni Erickson once said this, there just aren't enough songs about that. She's going through the tough times in life. You're going through the tough times in life. She said, think about what's ahead. Think about what it's like to go forward. Think about what lies ahead for every Christian. And so Joseph, what a man, what a story, what a testimony, what a character. Amazing, some of the stuff we've learned about this man over the last number of weeks here in the English church in Benidorm. And it all came through. Do you remember what he said? Remember that verse? Exodus 13, 19. Everything that Joseph thought would happen did happen. Moses took his bones and carried them up as he made Sure, he would. But finally, as we finish every message in this series, I may say to you, don't see Joseph, just see Joseph, see Jesus. Because Joseph is such a testimony to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's think of some of the things in Joseph's life. He was loved by his father. Our father God loves the son. Joseph was rejected by his brothers. Jesus was rejected because it said he came unto his own, his own received him not. Joseph was cast aside into a pit. His people took him and cast him aside, handed him over to the Romans to be crucified. But Joseph alone had the bread. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life.
Joseph alone became the savior of the world. People from every nation had to make their way to Egypt to this man Joseph to dispense the bread, to dispense salvation to them. Without Joseph's approval, they were going to die of hunger. Joseph became the savior literally of the world. Joseph offered forgiveness to his brothers as Jesus did. And Joseph is at the center of world history. Because if Joseph had not been taken by his brothers and cast into that pit, if Joseph had not been sold to the Ishmaelite tradesmen, if Joseph had not gone to Egypt, if Joseph would never have become the second in command of Egypt, Joseph would never have been there when the famine came, Joseph would not have been able to invite his father and brothers to live with him, the whole redemptive history would have been different, wouldn't it? The whole story would be different. Your whole Bible would be different. The whole narrative would be different. Joseph is right at the center of world history. And our Lord Jesus Christ is at the center of world history. He is the Savior of the world. He alone has the bread for you. He alone can offer you forgiveness and a new start and a new beginning. And it doesn't matter whether it's Vladimir Putin or Solensky or President Biden or the former President Trump or Prime Minister Johnson or Prime Minister Sunak or who was the other one who was there for a few days. Uh, tr uh, trust, right? It doesn't matter who these people are. Kings and presidents and prime ministers will come and they will go. Politics will win and go on cycles. People will be lifted up for a season, then they will be no more. But the Lord Jesus Christ stands supreme over all of history. So much so, in fact, that he divided the very world history in two. We talk about BC and we talk about AD. Jesus is that important. But not only that, he divides all of humanity in two. Because you're either with them or you're against them. You're either for him or you're anti him. You're either on his side in the kingdom of God or you're not on his side in the kingdom of darkness. You're either marked by his Holy Spirit or you're marked by the enemy. You're either adopted into his family or you're in the family of darkness. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. That's the Bible's teaching. And Jesus stands at the center of all of world history. And on the cross, he uttered these remarkable words as he suffered bled and died for the sins of the world. And he said, Father, Father, please forgive me. But they don't know what they're doing. What a Savior we have, eh? What a Jesus we have. What a King we have. And he's a King over these needy people here in Benidorm. Whether they know it or not, he's still the King of Kings. And he's still the Lord of Lords. Let's pray together. We thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for this truth. We pray, Lord, you might write it in all of our hearts and minds. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, come now and minister to us. Come and speak to us, Lord, we pray. Do not let these words roll over us. Do not let these words pass by us. Do not let them become irrelevant. Lord, this is life or death. This is decision time. This is time to choose. Just like you said to your people in the Old Testament, choose you this day who you will serve. So we're forced to make a decision whether we like it or not as to which side we're on. We are stunned by the integrity and the character and the greatness of this man Joseph. But we're even more stunned by the character and the integrity and the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord, have mercy upon us. Forgive us, Lord. We are such poor people. We have <coughs> failed so much, Lord. Our faith is so weak. Lord, at times we struggle to forgive others for petty grievances. Lord, sometimes we wonder, will we ever be able to finish well? Lord, we are so weak. Come and empower us and strengthen us. By your Holy Spirit now, visit every seat, Lord, every person in this building, to be your Lord. We just stay in the attitude of prayer as we sing over, Alleluia, Alleluia.
And we just give him the thanks and the praise. This is your chance to respond by way of thanking him for all that he's done.
this is a choose day for you. You've got to choose today how you're going to go in your life. Uh, may God bless you. And Lord God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for speaking into our hearts and lives. Take your word. We say to you, Lord, today, thank you. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord. He is Redeemer. Uh, we bless your name, Lord. Your blessed Redeemer. Thank you. There's no words that we could ever find that could possibly do justice to the greatness and the glory and the might and the power and the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we accept our stammering tongues. And Lord, help us, we pray, because we need your grace every moment of every day in order to help us to finish well. Please, do not let us falter. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just stay on our feet and we really just glorify the Lord as we leave right now and sing this wonderful song which really exalts the name of the Lord Jesus Christ.